probably the last, I say the last three months of last year up to this, this month of this year, um, for lack of, of better terms, has been hell um, for me um, and my family. As everybody knows, my grandmother, my aunt, were diagnosed with breast cancer at the same time. Um, my granddad had some issues with his hip and got diagnosed with severe arthritis in his hip and for about three weeks he was not able to walk. Um, and then to top all that off, going through everything the last month, Jess, either Jess, the kids, Jess and the kids, the kids, Jess and me, have been sick. And then this week, I'm supposed to be working on my message throughout the week, so I'm not procrastinating like Christian and Amanda tell me, uh, or Christian and Jess tell me not to do. So we have a major disaster happen Tuesday at work. Um, for those of you who don't know, I work for Hawkeye Communications. I was just made uh, foreman this week. Um, I got put in charge of a quarter million dollar project. Yeah, I get, get put in charge of a quarter million dollar project the second day into what we have about a $30,000 mistake happen. So I put in close to 60, 70 hours this past week to fix this problem. Been exhausted when I get home. And I was just like, you know what? I'm not going to let I'm not going to let it get to me. Um, then last night. I tell Jess, I'm like, my throat is killing me. Like my throat's killing me. I don't feel good. This morning I get here, I'm extremely shaky. My throat hurts. But I tell you right now, I am not going to let the devil take away from what the Lord has planned because I know that there's something. You guys are here for a reason. I'm going to bring this message for a reason, and the devil's not going to stop me. I don't care if I get up here and lose my voice. I'll get up here and place charades or something. That is, I mean, we're going we're gonna to get through this together. If you bring up my uh, title slide, please. Today's title is an uh, eight-second ride, life's eight-second ride. And Stacy, you're actually what helped me realize what I was going to preach on last week. <laughs> when you were talking last week, something hit me because I knew I was going to be preaching today. And something hit me. I'm like, you know, I'm not the only one that's struggling. I'm not the only one going through stuff. And it just hit me, like, rodeo, eight second, the rodeo's coming up. I don't know if that had anything to do with it. But what do I mean when I say eight second ride? Because everybody knows life is longer than eight seconds. Does anyone here live longer than eight seconds? Okay, we, we've all lived longer than eight seconds. But in a, the purpose of a rodeo, a cowboy has to last eight seconds on a bull. It's said to be the hardest eight seconds in all of sports, unless you're playing Clinton in the post in basketball. <laughs> but in those eight seconds, for this individual or those who ride, everything can change for better or for worse in those eight seconds. Last year, we went to the rodeo, me, Jess, and some of her friends, and we saw a gentleman, he was riding, he was riding, he got bucked off and landed on the ground and the bull landed down on his leg. And as soon as it landed on his leg, I, I knew I told her, his leg is broke. He's jacked. It, it's over with. He went, he, went, he went to get up and immediately fell down to the ground. And his leg was all cocked to the side and he was hopping over. And it bothered me because nobody was rushing to help him. I'm like, he can't even get away from the bull. Like, what, what are you doing? And I'm there with all nurses and doctors, so they're standing up screaming, help him, help him, you know. So it can change for better or worse in those eight seconds for the individuals who are doing it. The same applies to our lives. We're along for this eight-second ride, life. Life is our bull. And a lot of us are holding on for dear life itself. So... There are three big tools that I want to address that we have to help us. And obviously a bull rider, they have multiple different things to help them, to help them ride, help them to, to practice, and so forth and so on. 
Proverbs 27 and 17. Oh, there we go. You did have time to get them up. Thank you. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Our first tool I want to talk about is each other. Other believers or IE coming to church. I've heard it said multiple times, you do not have to be a Christian and, and have to go to church. It's not required for you to go to church to be a Christian. I, I guess you can argue both ways, but I got a question for you. We all have smartphones, right? We all use phones. If you walk around with your phone and you never put your phone on a charger, what's going to happen to it? It's going to die. Church is our charger. When you go through a hard week, when you go through a hard month, and you don't have something to revive you. If you don't come to church and get around other Christians, other believers, the only thing that's influenced you is the week that you've had, the situations that you've had, the problems that have come up. Church is where you come and you recharge your spiritual batteries. Amen. For uh, the bull riders, they talk to each other. They watch each other's rides. They see, well, he turned this way, or he leaned forward, or he leaned backwards when he should have done the opposite. They use each other to make themselves better. They also use each other for motivation. Church is where we can come and we can get motivated when we're going through things. I mean, this verse says it all. Iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. If you're having a hard time in life and you come to church, and you get around other believers who are, are on fire for God or maybe established a little bit more in their walk with God than you are, you can't help but get better. You look at those individuals and you're like, I want to strive to be more like that. Christian has been talking about it for a while with uh, the first Corinthians. You know, Paul is saying, um, be like me because I'm striving to be like God. So when you're looking at others and you come to church and you use this to revive yourself, to revive your spiritual batteries, it's not going to do anything but help you hold on longer, to make you, to make you stronger, to make you last with the bucks and the turns that are going to happen. You never know when you're going to need a greater spiritual power. So do what it takes to make sure your spiritual batteries are fully charged for our own personal rides that each of us are on. Because each of us are going through different things in life. Each of us have different things we're facing. The bull riders use each other for motivation. They use each other to be like, I want to be better than that guy. I want my last ride to be better. So others, other believers and coming to church is our first tool. It is a great thing for us to come to church and be able to gather and, and just to revive ourselves, to be happy. The songs today, James nailed it. Yeah. I mean, he absolutely nailed it. With, I mean, I just, I felt the presence of God almost as soon as he started singing. Yeah. Almost as soon as he started singing. My second, my second tool is prayer. The power of prayer. You better believe if these guys have any common sense whatsoever before they jump on the back of a bull, they are praying. I don't care what, whatever God it is they pray to, they are praying to something. You know, at the Lord or whatever, please help me not crack my head open. During that, a rider also has chaps. They have gloves. They have different smaller things that help them. The chaps are made of all leather. It protects their legs, their thighs. I don't know how many of you have seen a, a legless bull rider, but it would be kind of hard without legs. The gloves, if you take out their hands, how are they going to hold on to anything? Their legs also help them balance. The chaps add like a flare because they can put different designs. They can have them different colors. Some churches and some people believe 
uh, you know, the more elaborate prayer I can have, the more flair I can add to it, the better things are. It, it, it's nice, you know, if, if you're designated and called to be a prayer warrior, it's nice to be able to pray good. You know, it's, it's nice to be able to pray good, but that's not, the Lord doesn't say, thou shalt have the most beautiful prayer for me to hear you. It says, it, it just says, talk to me like you're talking to your friend. Come and sit with me and be with me. For us, prayer is one of the most powerful things we have. It's one of the most powerful things we have. If you would turn uh, 1 Kings 18, verses 33 through 39. I'm going to trip and fall over this. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it onto the offering and onto the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down and around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God of Israel and that I am your servant, and I have done these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you are Lord, our God, and that they are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil. And it also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried and said, Lord is God. The Lord is God. So this is coming from Elijah. He was having issues with the king of Israel at the time. And they were doing an offering and he had it. As it said, he had it soaked with water. I don't know many, how many of you have been camping and you've tried to start a fire with wet wood. It does not happen. Unless you have like lighter fluid, you can spray all over it and then light it on fire and then it still burns out whenever the lighter fluid's gone. You know, I'm a, I might get a little excited right here, but... um. You guys remember a couple weeks ago when everybody prayed or for me and my grandparents or my grandma and my aunt? I don't care what anybody tells me. I know for a fact the power of prayer works, and I'm going to tell you why. A couple reasons. One, my aunt went back to the doctor shortly after we prayed for her. Cancer gone. <laughs> my grandma... She did, she did have cancer, but the thing is, the Lord doesn't always heal us and work in the ways we think he should work. He's using the sickness to show his power. He's using the sickness to show what he's able to do. Because not only were they so worried about her surgery, having a surgery, they said, you're not going to make it. You have all these issues. You have all these problems. Your health is so poor. Not only did she not make it through the surgery to remove the cancer, she went home the very same day. So right now, my grandma is recovering, and at 7th, she's going back to the doctor, and they're gonna, they've run a test, and they're, gonna, they're finding out if the cancer is likely to come back or, or not. Me and my grandma, we're firmly believing, I don't care what test they run, it's not coming back. The Lord's taking care of it. The Lord's taking care of it, and I firmly believe that you guys were a huge part of that because of prayer, because of prayer. It's not always, you know, the, the flashiest thing. It's not always um, how you think things should go, but because of prayer, because of the power of prayer and what the tools we have, not only did that happen, but the things that have, have been going on in our life here have, have changed. I prayed this morning. I said, Lord, please help me get through this. I fell asleep on the floor last night with little Will, and uh, my back is not uh, feeling the greatest this morning on the way into church. My throat was hurting. I didn't feel good. I'm like, 
Lord, I know you had this message prepared. You gave this to me for a reason. You will not let me get here and not be able to preach this. And if that's, your, if that's what you want, then you're going to feel Christian with what you had already given me. And he's going to be able to come deliver the same exact thing. Amen. So prayer is a key. Other believers, other believers who believe how you believe praying, that those two things combined are so powerful. Those two things, like Christian said, will move mountains. Last week we were talking about it will move mountains. Just, you know, cancer is... It runs rapid through, through the world. It doesn't care who you are, kids, older, younger. It doesn't matter. But I tell you right now, the God we serve is stronger than cancer. The God we serve is stronger than the things that you're going through in your life. No matter if it's marital problems, no matter if it's financial problems, no matter if, um, if things don't seem to be, to be right, where you feel like this should have happened or that should have happened. As long as you hold on to God, you get around believers that will sharpen you and make you stronger. You get on your knees and you do not falter. The devil has no ground in your life. He has no ground in this church. Prayer and other believers will make you stronger. It will make this church stronger. You better believe that these guys practice. They don't just decide one day, I'm going to go jump on the back of a bull. They practice. It's repetitive. It's things they do. The more you pray, the more you come to church, the more you get devoted to God, the stronger you will get in your walk with him. It helps us keep our families covered. It helps us stay safe. It helps us hold on to our our bull. It keeps you level-headed. Me and Christian were talking about it this morning. When a bull is bucking, the last thing you want to do, if he bucks forward, the last thing you want to do is to lean forward with it. Or if it bucks back, the last thing you want to do is lean back with it. Because what's going to happen is you're going to get unbalanced. Balance is key in riding a bull. So if you're out and the devil is coming at you, but you never talk to God. You never have a conversation with them. You know, how are you going to keep your balance? How are you going to stay level-headed? Elijah soaked everything down. Did he have to do that? No. He did it for a reason. He soaked everything down, and then he prayed, and he said, Lord, answer me. Answer me, you know, rain fire down upon these people so that they can see. That was a prayer of a man. Elijah did great things. If you read through, uh, through the book and see everything he did, he did great things. But one of the key things that he always did, he prayed and prayed. And he, he stayed prayed up. He stayed ready. Again, he was just a man. So the things that he had happened, the things that he was able to accomplish, he did it through God. They're still able to be done today. The third thing, the third tool for us is our Bibles. Probably the most important thing for a bull rider is his bull rope. Without the rope, it's impossible. I mean, you're not going to just jump on the back of a bull and just squeeze together with your thighs unless you have thunder thighs like the jaws of life. <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen. A 1,500-pound animal that is mad and does not want you on his back, you need something to hold on to. The bull rope is a rider's lifeline. If they let go of that, it's all over. Without the rope, he has no chance of staying on the bull. The Bible itself is our lifelines. Hebrews 4, verses 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, 
It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So what that is saying is that the Bible is stronger than any weapon that the devil can bring towards you. Everything we need, everything we need to know, God has written down in this book right here. Christian has said it. This book is 100% fact. Yes, man may have physically wrote it, but God gave them what to write. What we need to understand about the Bible is the power behind the words. The rope is what allows the writer to hang on and make it to the end of his ride. Our Bibles are our foundation. They give us the ability to stand strong. If you don't know the Word of God, if you aren't reading the Word of God, if you're not praying to God, if you're not engaging with other believers, what do you have to stand on? When the devil brings this stuff to you, when the devil comes at you, attacks your children, attacks your financial stability, your family, people that you you miss and you can't do anything about and you know they're struggling, what do you have to stand on if you don't know the Word of God? I, I guarantee you the devil understands. He knows. He knows the Word. He likes to leave out the ending but he knows the word. You get in the Bible and you make it your foundation. You have the ability to stand up, stand strong, stand eye to eye and toe to toe with the devil and look at him. I know how this ends. I know how this ends. I've read the book. And so have you. Let me remind you how this ends. This ends with you face down in a pile of bull crap because I'm going to win. This right here is all you need. You take this combined with prayer, combined with the the help of others backing you up, combined with the church that loves God that's after the same thing you are. We will be unstoppable. Nothing the devil does. Devil, and I'm telling you right now, you've come at me so hard the past couple months. And I have been so anxious to get up here and to preach. I've missed it. This week has been so hard, but I'm telling you right now, you will not stop me. You will not stop this church. This church is to do great things. People in this church, you're involved in something that is going to be great. I urge you to stand strong on your foundation, which is your Bible. And when the devil comes at you, you say, look, I've got my foundation. My feet are firmly planted where they're supposed to be. What are you coming at me against? You have nothing to bring against me. Nothing. The Bible, God, prayer, the others, the power that we have through these tools will help us be successful. If a writer holds on to that rope and he makes it to eight seconds, he's victorious. They don't know if it's going to happen or not. See, we have one up on them. They don't know if they're going to make it the eight seconds. We do. Amen. We've already been promised victory. The Lord's already told us. He said, I've got you. I'm carrying you. You're my children. James saying it this morning. The enemy has been defeated. He already knows that. He likes to forget it. And he comes at us. Because maybe we're not in our Bibles like we should be. Maybe we don't pray like we should. Maybe we don't, you know, hang out with each other and conversate and try to encourage each other like we should. So when, when that happens, he has room to come and attack us. I know what my God has told me. I know, standing on his word, praying, coming to church, talking with others about God. Not only will we make it our eight seconds on our ride, but we will shake the gates of hell by doing it. We will shake the gates of hell by doing it. And if you do, if you do these things, I guarantee you other people are going to look at you and they're going to be like, 
this is somebody I could look up to. This is somebody that I respect because they tell it how it is. They're not just the type of Christian that puts posts on Facebook. Oh, thank you, God, for this. Thank you, God, for that. But they don't come to church on Sundays. Oh, thank you, God, for this. Thank you, God, for that. But they never talk about God outside of Facebook. You know, people who, who look at Christians a lot of times think of us as, as hypocrites because we don't do what we say. If a bull rider says, oh, yeah, it's no problem. I, I've, I've rode eight seconds all the time, blah, blah, blah. And then they jump on a bull and get thrown off immediately. Like you've never done it before. People are going to look at him and be like, you know, you're a joke. This whole, this whole deal was a joke. Now, granted, we have more tools. And Christians have been talking about the spiritual gifts. Those are some key tools that we have. The Lord just implanted on my heart to speak about these because I feel like if you get founded in the word, you get founded in prayer, you can't help but then be filled with the other gifts. If you know the word, if you pray, the Lord's going to hear you and he's going to open up the gates of heaven for you. Church, let us use the tools that the Lord has given us to tighten our grips, not only to make it in our ride and in life, but to help others make it in theirs. Because the devil will try so hard to take as many people with him as he can because he knows he's lost. The past several months have been incredibly hard. They have been incredibly hard. And the devil, honestly, I think there for a while, I talked to Christian and it just, he was playing with my mind so much. He was playing with my mind so much. And then last week when Stacy was talking, the Lord just put this on me. And I knew, I knew what I was going to talk about. Church, I pray that we never misuse, but we always use the tools that God's given us to better ourselves. And I want to, I want to close in prayer. I want, to, I want to pray, and if everybody would stand. And everyone can, you can pray out loud, you can pray silently, however you want to do it. But I want the devil to know this prayer, this prayer is for, specifically for the devil. I want him to know and understand that this church will not falter. That the people of this church we'll stand strong on the foundation that God has laid for us. That we have each other's backs. Lord God, I thank you for the opportunity to be in church this morning. I thank you for the opportunity to come and to deliver the word that you have put on my heart. Devil, I now come to you face to face, toe to toe, I tell you the chains, the mountains that you've put in front of the individuals of this church. Those who are here today and those who are not able to make it. The sicknesses in family. The sicknesses in the financial abilities. Lord, the hunger that the devil is just He's trying to to starve our little spiritual babies. I bind you in the name of Jesus. I come against you right now in the name of Jesus, which there is no name greater than that name. Devil and all your demons, I tell you right now, you have no place in anybody's family. You have no place in this building. 
I come against you and I cast you out in the name of God the Father. Let the people of Cedar Rapids know when we walk by who we are. We are yours. James sang it beautifully. The enemy has been defeated. Not only has he been defeated, but we're walking into the camp and we're taking back what he has taken from us. It was given to us, not to you. This is our time. This is the Lord's time. Not only have you awoken a sleeping giant, but you've made him mad. You've made him mad, and Satan, there's nowhere you can run. We will come to the gates of hell. We will kick it down. We will drag you out kicking and screaming. Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for what I feel. I, let, I asked you not to let this just be a, a Sunday high, but this to be something that lasts throughout the weeks, that lasts throughout the months, that when the devil comes at us, because you better believe he's going to come at us because we've called him out. That he will come at us and he will realize that we are standing strong on the word of God. We are standing strong on your presence, on what you have said. Like the little old lady last week when she prayed that the rain would not come. Lord, your promises clearly state that you will not let us fall. That nothing can separate us from your grace. Church, now it's up to us to believe that. To hold on to that rope and to never let it go. The devil is going to cause our bulls to buck to jump and to turn. But what he's not expecting, what he doesn't understand is that there's no bull more powerful than God. He's waiting to just help us, to give us the strength that we need. Devil, I bind you in everything you're trying to do. And I just pray anointing and blessing on this church and every individual in it. I ask you to touch Teresa and her family. Lord, bless them and strengthen them. I ask you to let a move of Christ come from this church all the way to them and let them to feel your presence. Lord, there's no mountain too big. There's no ocean or vast waters too deep. Lord, I thank you so much for what I feel today. You are the Almighty One. You are the Alpha and Omega. Satan, you have no bound in any of our lives. In your holy and precious name, I pray, God. Amen. So this morning, um, I, I didn't know what Will was preaching on. I don't vet his sermons. I trust him as a man of God to hear from the Lord and to speak as the Lord moves. And, and this morning, I was having a weird line of thoughts. And I don't know if y'all ever just have random lines of thoughts that just carry on kind of awkwardly. But this happens to me all the time. What I was thinking about was 
a, a message or two ago, I was talking about my testimony, and I think it was last week I was talking about faith and how I have faith because I could say I've seen God do these things and I've seen God move this way. And it's a way in which I can testify to people to speak of how real my God is. And I'm thinking about this, this part of the message, and then I just for some reason I thought, but what if I met someone of a different religion who could look at me and say, well, that's funny because I've seen my God do those things and I've seen my God move that way and I've had conversations with my God, then what would I do? And instantly this verse from 1 Kings came up that, that Will was preaching on. And, and I didn't even know that this was what he was talking about, but the Lord reminded me of this time where Elijah soaked the altar with water to prove who God was. And I just want to, to confirm and reaffirm what Will was preaching this morning because I think it's so real to all of us. And sometimes Satan would have us be handicapped by not understanding this. See, Elijah was a man of God. He was a man of God's word. As Will was preaching on, he, he, he grounded himself in God's word. He was, of course, a man of prayer. And he was a man who was always trying to sharpen himself with other believers. In fact, he started schools of prophecy where he would work with, with other prophets and, and to, to grow closer to God. And basically at this time, as Will was preaching on, uh, um, Jezebel and Ahab were trying to kill Elijah. And eventually Elijah became the last prophet in the land. And in desperation, this event happened where 450 of Baal's prophets, of, of Satan's prophets, came together on a mountain against him. And Elijah said, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm tired of this. Let's just prove once and for all who is God. Is it Baal or is it the God of Israel? And he said, you set up an altar and I'll set up an altar. You choose a bull, I'll take the other one. And so they set up an altar and a bull. And like Will was preaching, Elijah covered his altar in water. Just dumped bucket loads of water. And these 450 prophets, they didn't. They just put the, the altar together and put the bull on it and started praying. And I just want to read just a little bit before where Will, Will started reading because I think it can personally apply to us. So this is from 1 Kings chapter 18. I'll start at, at, at verse 22. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us. And let, let's choose this, let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it to pieces and lay it on wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare another bull and lay it on wood, and I will put no fire to it. And we will call upon the names of our gods. Let the God who is real answer with fire. And the people said it was well. So they said, the God who is real, let that God light their, his altar aflame. Verse 25. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourself one bull and prepare it first, for you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. They took a bull that was given to them, and they prepared it, and they called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon. And they said, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice. And no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. This is the part that I want to encourage you with, each and every one of you individually. Verse 27. At noon, Elijah mocked them. He mocked them. At noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is God. Maybe he's pondering something. Maybe he's too busy musing. Maybe he's in thought. This is great. Maybe he's relieving himself. Here's 450 dudes crying out to their God and one Elijah. And Elijah says, maybe your God's on the toilet and that's why he's not answering with fire. Right? And then Elijah, of course, goes and, and, and he covers his altar with water and he says one quick prayer and that altar is set aflame. The reason why I share that is because sometimes, and I've even heard this taught, that we should be careful when we're coming against Satan, when we're coming against the enemies because he's powerful and we, we need to be careful and we don't want to come. And I think that's nonsense because my God is so much stronger. Here's what I would say. I'd say we don't need to be careful. We just need to be, live a life as Will was preaching where we're prepared. And I guarantee you, church, each and every person in here, if you are spending time with other believers as iron sharpens iron, if you are spending time in the word of God, if you are reading and you are learning, 
And if you are spending time in prayer, I have never met a Christian like that who was not mighty and powerful. And if that's you, there is no reason you can't look at Satan and say, what's the problem, bro? You on the toilet? What's going on, man? I thought you were coming against me. I love what Will was saying, how he was sick, because I can tell you, man, the, the days where I am sick are one out of seven. It's Sunday. That's when I get sick, man. I'm always getting sick on Sunday. And I can tell you time and time again, I will be sick up until the point where I stand up here. And then God shows up. And every single time I've made it through it. Because Satan's got nothing on me. Satan's got nothing on you. And there may be trials, and there may be pain, and there may be fire, and you may be hurt. But if you are in your word, if you are with the encouragement of other believers, and if you are in prayer, I guarantee you, you will get through it, and you will get through it victoriously. You have nothing to be afraid of. Amen. Lord, I thank you so much for this word. The enemy's been defeated. Oh, it's so nice to live victoriously. Father, I thank you so much for the encouragement of this word that you gave through Brother Will. Father, I pray that it sticks with us. Lord, I just, even as Amanda's singing, I just think of the triumph of that, that, that grave being empty and how victorious your disciples must have felt when they heard the news. <laughs> oh, Lord, I thank you for that victory. I thank you for that victory. I pray that this message would stay close to each and every one of us. Father, that we would live victorious lives. And as we feel things start to slip and as we feel Satan start to gain ground, would you remind us of this message? Let us get back into our word, get back into prayer, and get back into the fellowship of other believers. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.